Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. I pray this finds you well and blessed and everybody watching this in uh, Facebook land and around the world. I hope that your lockdown isn't too oppressive and that your soul is free to travel to be close to Allah Ta'ala. Uh, Sheikh, how are you? Alhamdulillah, yes, locked down, but uh, spirits are high. Mashallah, and um, how are things in Cambridge? Uh, Grey, uh, dreary, drizzly, uh, what you'd expect from December in this uh, far northern island. Do you, do you love the weather, though, as a British person? Because I found myself in Australia walking in the rain, and I remember an Australian going, she's got to be a pom. Only poms like the rain that much, or are you a sun seeker secretly? Uh, I don't know. I'm more of an indoor person, I suppose. But uh, I, I don't think it's particularly good for the human spirit to see the colour grey every time. Mm. Um, I think uh, we're designed to be uh, refreshed spiritually by bright colours. So I guess uh, uh, give me the beach and uh, cooling drink anytime. Wow, well, that, that is a piece of information that, that I've never had before, mashallah. Thank you so much for joining us. I've just finished reading your, your book. I'm not going to do, look guys, I'm not gonna do a lengthy um, introduction. Please look up the work of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad yourself. He is a, a light in a time of darkness and he's the Dean of Cambridge Muslim College. And uh, he is the author of several books and also a translator of important works by Al-Ghazali Rahimullah. And the rest is up to you. Find, find out more on YouTube, inshallah, because I don't want to embarrass Sheikh by, by, by giving him so the top 10 hits of Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, okay? But today, I really want to introduce you to Travelling Home, which is the latest book by you, Sheikh. Um, let's talk a little bit first about the anxiety and the trouble that we're seeing amongst uh, Muslims who are either uh, moved to the West by family relationships or born here and prone to now adjustment fatigue. Um, the same worries as everybody else, but, but perhaps an added anxiety because we're not getting integration right. Well, how, how do you describe the, the feeling at the moment? Well, it can often be difficult to differentiate between the angst that people feel as members of often misunderstood minorities and that which is just part and parcel of existing in a modern society. You have to remember that uh, uh, the mental health crisis continues to explode exponentially. Uh, the prescriptions for antidepressants in the UK have doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, references to mental health care and emergency services continue to go up. Uh, and as society fragments, we are now the first country in the world to have our own minister of loneliness, mm -hmm. which indicates you know, how bad things are, about 9 million people in England with uh, clinical uh, loneliness and the, the uh, mental stress that goes with that. So it is difficult, as I say, to differentiate between the angst of minorities and that which is just part of being a fragmenting modern society. That which is specific to minorities, I think relates sometimes if they happen to be ethnic minorities, uh, to questions of, of, of racism, of discrimination. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to do in the book is to look at the issue not just in terms of uh, self-exculpation, Muslims finding reasons for their own uh, unfortunate situation, but rather to see things uh, in terms of how we can look ahead as a religious community. Uh, I was listening recently to a talk by Mustafa Tseric, uh, the former Mufti of Bosnia, who is warning us European Muslims not to sit in a kind of warm bath of victimhood, blaming everybody else for our uh, lack of success in so many areas. And he quoted Martin Luther King, who didn't say, uh, I have a complaint, but who said, I have a dream. Mm -hmm. So the book really is not looking at all of the reasons why we may be uh, in this difficult situation, but looking ahead to see how as a religious community, rather than just as a group of minorities for whom religion is one part of the, 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 the identity, um, can actually look ahead and try and become leaders in this admittedly challenging environment. I love that um, phrase, the, the, the warm bath that you mentioned, because that makes me think of, you know, a lobster. You, you're gradually going to a sleep and you're dying at the same time. Yes, it's uh, one of the things that I talk about in several chapters in the book, in fact, is uh, the prospects for the new populism across Europe. 
uh, the far right parties and in some cases they're not really far right because they adopt a lot of sort of social justice progressive politics a lot of them are very pro-gay for instance a lot of them are very pro-feminist and using these social justice issues really as sticks with which to beat not just muslims but other conservative communities and and migrants so uh, the question is i suppose uh, how warm has the water got? You know, when does the lobster start to realise that it's not just getting warm, but that it's in lethal danger? A question that uh, minorities have faced before, of course, in Europe, which is a continent of, of, uh, of, of troughs as well as peaks. Uh, when did it become clear to the, German, uh, to the German Jews in the 1930s that things were really looking catastrophic and it was time for them to um, look elsewhere for their future. It wasn't really clear to many of them that, that things were really getting lethally dangerous. So without wishing to be alarmist, because I don't think that's the religious way at all, we have hope, we have tawakkul, reliance on Allah. I think that it is good for us to try and find ways of objectively taking the temperature of our neighbours to see uh, how uh, warm is, the, is their enmity at the moment and where it's likely to go next. And I have a whole chapter, of course, on the Bosnian catastrophe, which may or may not be the shape of things to come for other uh, bits of Muslim Europe. I don't know if the host would like to intervene at this point, but um, uh, I think I'm online, but I'm not sure that Lauren is with us. Welcome back, uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim. Uh, sorry for this uh, interruption. It seems like uh, Sister Lauren is uh, not online. Uh, she will uh, join us uh, very soon, inshallah. Uh, in like I can keep on talking while we get her back in case people are getting bored. Yes, uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, um, yeah. You know, actually, this is, this is a very special time when we're talking about COVID-19. Uh, anxiety and be, being Muslim in such a situation where, you know, feel like Islamophobes are targeting, targeting you. What, what is your advice for, for Muslim youth at this specific time? Well, I think that uh, the believer always looks at what's positive in every situation because he's looking for the Noor not looking for the zulumat, not looking for the shadows and the darkness. That's just the fitra of the believer. The hypocrite or the weak person looks for the darkness and, and looks downwards. Um, I think that uh, inevitably there are problems of transition and the problems are within the Muslim community as well as within uh, the so-called host communities. But uh, I think we need also to be looking at our intention uh, because uh, the first hadith of Islam, which comes right at the beginning of the hadith collection, Sahih al-Bukhari, is the famous hadith that talks about intention, in the al bin niyat. But that's also the hadith of hijra, of migration. So yes. the question of migration in Islam, which has always happened, we've always been a, a mobile community, Islam spread through the world because people were moving, uh, is linked absolutely to the question of intention. So we need to look at our intention. And my sheikh always told me this, that the Muslims in England, they came in order to, uh, for economic reasons, really, not for Allah and his messenger. Uh, so if we start to change that and say, we're not here um, yes. to make money, we're here in order to call people to Allah and his messenger. In other words, the niyyah becomes tabliq and da'wah. Then I think that we'll see a lot of doors opening for us because a niya matriya, as they say, the, the, the niya is a riding beast. If you have a really good intention, Allah will open doors for you. But if your intention here is just to kind of get a better job, that's dunya, dunya will get you and certainly will get your children. But if the intention is this beautiful one, which is following in the footsteps of the Anbiya, the prophets, alayhim wassalam, then inshallah, there will be qabul, there will be acceptance from heaven, and we will see our situation change very quickly. 
Hopefully, inshallah. Welcome back, Sister Luen. We were talking about uh, the challenges facing the Muslims, especially in this time of COVID-19 and in Europe. And uh, Sheikh Al-Hakim Mouad was talking about the Islamic attitude of being positive, being uh, looking at the full side of the cup and uh, the importance of intention. Now, uh, back to you. Thank you. So sorry about that. Unstable connections in an unstable world. Um, Sheikh, with Brexit looming in the UK, we've got this challenging time. Nobody quite knows what's going to happen yet next, except there's going to be queues at various ports. I wonder about the vaccination against the fearfulness that you talk about in, in your book, this, this, the, this ability for everything to shake us. And what is our what what are we doing here in the West? How how are we integrating with disintegration? How are we what what is our role as um, Ishmaelites? And actually, can you describe? There are two terms in here, so I'm going to go backwards a bit. Two terms in your book that are really fascinating, and I, I think bear uh, a discussion on their own: Ishmaelites and Lahabists. Mm -hmm. And then, what is our duty as the Ishmaelites? in the Western disintegrating nations? Well, I think that uh, we are called to be shuhada'a ala nas, witnesses for mankind. And a witness is not really somebody who grumbles all the time and points fingers of blame. Uh, so the, issue, the, the believer, the witness, is the one who, in the midst of catastrophe, calls people to Allah and his messenger and points out that things are basically all right and that what human beings have always needed and the foundation of the human personality and soul in all ages since before Stonehenge has been a belief in the ghaib, in the unseen, in the reality that is behind the surface of things. And that without that, we're not really going to be able to cope with these increasing turbulent times which are coming, not just Brexit, but climate change and artificial intelligence. And the world is really being upended at the moment. And I think to stay sane, and I quote some of the, the, the sheikhs on this, to stay sane in this increasingly unstable world uh, as the deck pitches beneath our feet and old certainties are, uh, are, are, are removed, that we need to just look upwards uh, and to remember uh, the, the Allah's rope, Hadlullah, uh, because without that, we're just going to go down with, with the ship and experience the same kind of anxieties as everybody else. So we've seen this during the lockdown um, because our mosque in Cambridge has kind of gone online, but we also have outreach programs to sort of local communities, people are being isolated, and we engage with local churches. And what everybody can see is that the, uh, the people who have a religious faith deal with it so much better than the people who don't. Not just because you know, the, the clubs and the pubs are closed, so the secular people are getting bored, but because people have a sense of a wider hope of optimism, they can uh, retreat into themselves and they can pray. And a lot of Muslims are telling me this is the best time of their lives because they're really able to get down to reading Quran, to re-engaging with immediate family, to praying, to being less distracted by dunya. So this is a kind of golden hour for a lot of Muslims, I think. But of course, if people's uh, interest is only in dunya and most of dunya has been cut off from them, of course, they're, they're starting to, to malfunction. A lot of them do have these mental health problems. So I think we're learning a lot from this etiquette, as it were, from this retreat that, that has been imposed upon us. And maybe it's even a divine message you know, to remind us of what human beings really can't do without. I, I feel um, that in my own small life as well, that that this ihtikaf, this, what are we going to do? What should, what, how do we fill our time has become a real question, you know? Mm -hmm. Are we studying uh, for the exam that is life? Or, you know, th this thing about um, throwing ourselves into Netflix films for six months, and then we're gonna come out somehow improved and happier. And again, this comes down to how do we as Muslims put across, Sheikh, that there is a better way than this without coming across as really, judgmental i you know i'm accused of my own family of oh here she comes miss piety and i'm just not putting it right help us people are not really open to sermonizing because of the individualism of the age that wants everybody to feel themselves and they don't want anybody else to correct them uh, so the best thing to do really is and again it's the quranic expression shahada ala nas witnesses to mankind so that we maintain a better style of life, so that we're the people who are delivering food parcels, so we're the people who are kind of bright and happy 
in the morning uh, because we've had an opportunity to start the day with prayer and people will immediately see that. Um, so uh, all of the sort of anti-Western rhetoric that we hear from a lot of Muslims, I think is missing the point and probably is counterproductive that if you just show people what it is to live uh, a normative, normal human religious life, uh, and people see the, the ruins that are increasingly replacing where society used to be in the modern West, and people will come naturally, and we see this all the time in our new mosque in Cambridge, we have about one shahada, one new conversion every week, and people kind of treat the religion as a kind of lifeboat. They're just so delighted to be on a place, in a place that stable and consistent, have an ancient form of, of ritual to be able to do things that their ancestors did and that there's really nothing else out there, just stormy seas of constant change and hopeless desires. So yeah, we just need to be ourselves. Don't panic. Remember the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, don't panic. On the cover, it was written, don't panic. Well, that's really written on the cover of the Quran, really, because it says, la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. The real believers, the awliya, they don't fear, nor do they grieve. So we don't, shouldn't really experience depression because Allah is the end of all things and that's the best end. And we shouldn't be afraid because everything is his decree. So that's our don't panic. And if we're in that state, people will look at us with amazement and think, hey, I want some of that. Mm. Uh, many of us who accept Islam are met by something of a barrage of, barrage of cultural loathing from our new community, unfortunately. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, post-colonial anger. It's almost, you know, it can feel as, as a, an English Muslim, like we're gonna get revenge on you for what the awfulness of colonialism. And many of us who mm -hmm. come to Islam were anti-colonialism anyway, but, but we don't get to, to feel ourselves in our skin for about a decade because we kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater. You, you talk about um, Abdullah Quilliam, Rahimullah, the, mm -hmm. the only and last Sheikh al-Islam of the British Isles, very warmly, and his community in Liverpool, who, um, who suffered at the hands of the haters, but who did Islam in a very British way. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, I think it's interesting that we, perhaps unusually amongst the different bits of the European Ummah, have that interesting history or prehistory, which in many ways is quite inspirational, because in Victorian England, the prejudice was probably greater than what we face now. People were more insular, uh, there was a certain militant Christianity, uh, and so the early Liverpool community, their mosque was constantly vandalised, uh, people would have horse dung rubbed in their faces as they came to prayer. People would break into the mosque and put powdered glass in the carpet. And it was a constant fight that they had to maintain that place. And yet hundreds of people at the time became Muslim. Uh, and the way they did that, I think, was because they just showed Islam as Islam rather than Islam as tricked out in a particular cultural garment. Uh, <clears throat> so in Islam, we have this category of, of orf, which means custom. So the English have their customs, the Bangladeshis have their customs, the Venezuelans have their customs. And those things are usually really respected in Sharia as long as they don't involve uh, Sharia violations. But when you, for instance, if you're British and you go and live in Pakistan and you maintain all of your British thing the way the Raj did, but you're a Muslim, that's not correct. You adopt to the local culture. So one of the greatest of all British Muslim exports um, uh, Shahidullah Faridi, who was a convert from the 1920s, uh, went out to India and then Pakistan, uh, really went native in the positive and necessary uh, sense of this, and became a, a sheikh. And he had thousands of disciples by the time he died in Karachi in 1979. He was one of the luminaries of, of spiritual Pakistan and helped so many people, but he was writing and speaking in Urdu, dressing in local clothes, he did what one does. You, you adapt to the local environment rather than stick out like a sore thumb. So reciprocally, the Muslims who are successful in da'wah down the ages are those who have enculturated. If you look at how the Islam spread in Indonesia, Java is the world's most populous island, about 100 million Muslims living there. It used to be Hindu, so that's a major transformation. They did this by when they went there, wherever they came from in the Ummah, putting on Javanese clothes, taking on Javanese names, speaking the Javanese language and making it a great literary vehicle, 
using Javanese designs for their mosques and the people came into Islam because they weren't veiled by the orf, by the custom of a faraway place from seeing the beauty of Tawheed. So that's one of the great success stories of Islamic da'wah and mission, how that great Hindu place became a great Muslim place. Java, just one island, has more Islamic universities today than all the Arab countries put together. Wow. That's a great achievement of da'wah that those people did in the 16th century. Why? Because they didn't make an idol of their own culture, but they wanted to call people just to Allah and his messenger. And they didn't mind if they were wearing some strange Javanese thing on their head, that was superficial. The important thing was not to create a, a barrier, a veil between people and the truth of Islam in the form of, of cultural forms that were dispensable in Sharia. So here's, here's where, where we come into to a kind of spiritual and sometimes physical conflict is we send our young anyway to school and university. We hand them over to the secular state mm -hmm. and then expect them to somehow inculcate Muslim values mm -hmm. and to bring them to the mainstream. When actually what's happened is they're so integrated with those values that they've lost Islam. Yeah. Well, that's because they were never given by their parents and often it wasn't the parents' fault because they simply didn't have the vocabulary, the context for it, a way in which they can be Muslim outside the context of the cult uh, cultures of the countries of origin. So, say, the Kurdish parent in Berlin can only imagine Islam as part of his or her Kurdishness. And the child is taught, this is part of who you are. When the child goes to school, university, college, becomes German, effectively, which happens 99% of the time, that's just part of what the melting pot is about, then feels, well, I can't do Islam because that's part of that identity that I don't belong to any longer. What that person can't find is a German Muslim identity that will enable them to continue the religion, which is universal in all of its immensity and beauty, but in the context of a different orf or a different cultural context. Now that's starting to change because you do find in the German context, for instance, in the Dutch context, mosques that are da'wah oriented and tawhid oriented and are not just fortresses for the preservation of the orf, the custom of a beautiful but, but distant place. But still it's very difficult for the younger generation. Sometimes converts grumble a lot, but actually I think it's harder for the, young, for the second generation of people from migrant heritage because they're caught between not just two things like us, the West and Islam, but three things, the West, Islam, and a culture of origin. And it becomes a much more complicated conversation for them. So I think we're moving into a new space where the Imams and the mosques are starting to recognize the validity of an orf that is European rather than imported. But so far it's become really difficult and there's a real identity crisis for a lot of young people who sometimes simply live double lives. So with mum and dad, they're still Kurdish and they do that thing. But at, at uh, the university or with their friends, they're completely German. So they live this, this dual existence, which is spiritually disastrous, of course, because there can't really be any ikhlas in it. What do we ask of, of the mainstream society then? Um, what, what does a second generation Pakistani, British, uh, young Muslim ask of society? Don't, don't accept me until I speak fluent, you know, perfect, sorry, English. And, and only eat bangers and mash? No, I, they all, I mean, the thing is that it's changing on both sides because the ambient culture is no longer the single recognizable thing that it used to be 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you could always tell an Englishman abroad uh, because even the way he walked and the cigarettes he smoked and the car and the clothes, it was unmistakable, a particular, uh, sometimes slightly amusing type on the streets mm -hmm. of Paris or Berlin or, Kuala Lumpur, now everybody's globalized. So one of the things I talk about in the book is how do you integrate, which is necessary for da'wah purposes, if you're to be understood, into a society which is losing its own identity. And this is part of the problem with the populist and the nationalist anti-Muslim movements in Europe, in that many of them are quite understandably panicking and grieving over the loss of their own sense of self. Mm. Uh, because they feel they're just part of a globalized reality with entertainment and clothes and cars and everything is the same. Uh, but they find immigrants as the scapegoat, which is completely unfair because it wasn't the immigrants who globalized them. It was Hollywood or some other globalizing culture. So uh, part of the issue is how do we demonstrate the universality of Islam 
in a context where people are losing their own particularities. Uh, and that I think means that people have to do some quite complex and selective quarrying of what's local. So for instance, if you build a mosque in Denmark, what should it look like? If it looks like a mosque in Malaysia, you've lost the Dawa battle because you've announced that Islam is something that doesn't belong and is mm. some exotic thing that proclaims its, its difference. Uh, but if you want to make it look Danish, you look around and you find all the Danish architects are not doing that, they're doing the international style. It's all steel towers and glass slabs and, and it's globalization. So uh, the process of enculturation is more complex for us than it was say at the time of the great uh, conversions in Java because the local culture is dying so fast. So Islam says, occupy that space, become great masters of the English or the Danish language and do the things that Muslims have always done. But if those things are in crisis, huh, then you have this, this problem. And this, I think, is part of the anxiety that Muslims are facing, that this traditional enculturation is becoming really complicated because of the collapse of the local identities. So in reality, when we're told to uh, integrate, what governments and social services and journalists tend to mean is accept liberal social attitudes. Mm. When they say accept British values, they don't really mean sort of wear a duffel coat and listen to Elgar and be a kind of stereotypical English person because they're not like that any lo longer. What they mean by British values is international politically correct liberal values. So it's not really integration into what's British, it's assimilation into a global rootless culture uh, that is generically hostile to everybody's heritage. And that's where it becomes very difficult for Muslims, I think. In a sense, globalization makes our enculturation more difficult, not less. Mm, because we're, we're, we're the visible front line of a tradition that doesn't back down from the big questions yep. and doesn't immediately change because the social mores. Um, you talk very movingly, actually, in the book, for me as a parent of a child, rather, of 60s, 1960s parenting of, uh, you know, we both went to New End School briefly and we know about hippie, yeah. uh, hippie kids very well, uh, that having nothing to hold on to. I'm going to read a little line here. Here is a further good reason, you say, why Muslim insiders need to develop an active pastoral theology. And you talk about offering a fully Islamic moral com compass. Tell us how that will look with a disintegrating society without rubbing people up the wrong way. And let's be quite clear here, we don't actively have much support for um, the kinds of justice spoken about in the Quran from the Christian community who, who have backed away from a lot of their traditional views. Yeah, I mean, the, the one of the beautiful things about the Quran is that it does encourage positive dialogue and engagement with the Ahl al-Kitab. So it's not a kind of them and us zero sum game, but we can form partnerships with them. And I think that there is a lot to be said for a kind of uh, ecumenical uh, alliance. And the American Muslim writer Charles Upton has written about this, that in order to strengthen ourselves, we need to reach out to other conservatives and other religious communities because on our own, we're, we're pretty weak. Uh, and you can still find in those communities, people who don't accept uh, the modern social orthodoxies and regard them as individualistic and anti-Christian, anti-Jewish and, and destructive of, of the family and of human flourishing. Uh, and very often, even though the conservatives in those traditions historically have been the ones that haven't done interfaith or reached out to other communities very much, they can be really insular. It can be really strengthening for Muslims to see that there are people who are, have their backs against the same wall and feel equally oppressed by the kind of woke agenda which is being used as a sledgehammer in order to break down uh, traditional, uh, traditional values. And there's more people than the media would suggest who are unhappy with uh, the way things are going on many of these new agendas. Uh, not just older people, but one encounters a lot of young people who are told so endlessly, define yourself, define your sense of being, interpret your own desires and that's who you are and they find that not satisfying 
And that's not surprising because historically young people have always been integrated into higher truths, the truths mm. of the tribe, the truth of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman by elders. And that becomes part of their coming of age and part of their, their maturation and their awareness that I'm not just what my desires and my self-understanding might suggest, but I can move up to the way of my ancestors. And that's the normal human way. And it's been so for a hundred thousand years and it's part of what the brain of young people requires. And when that's taken away from them and they're told, no, that's all wrong. Look into yourself and see what you desire. What are your urges? How do you see yourself? Uh, young people are not in a position to work something profound like that out. Um, most people aren't. And when they're told that is who you are, that's your identity, it can really impose on them uh, enormous responsibilities. And I think a lot of them are, are crumbling under all of those choices and options because there are so few stable landmarks now. So when you say, this is Islam, this is a man, this is a woman, this is how the family should be, this is how we bring up children, this is how we've always worshipped. Almighty God is compassionate, merciful. We have these ancient things that human beings always did, fasting and pilgrimage and respect for elders. There's something in them in a kind of ancestral memory that recognizes this and kind of wants it. And I think that uh, there's more young people with that yearning for historic human normality than the media would, would suggest. And I also think that there will be a snapping back to that with a lot of the sort of extreme feminist agenda. This woman in Paris who's written a bestseller that basically says men are inferior. And that's part of a certain feminist agenda there. That it's all becoming so aberrantly strange in terms of what have historically been gender roles, for instance, that I think that when that chatter and that public pressure uh, starts to relax, people will immediately snap back and find joy in, in something more, more historically normative. Um, we don't know when that slapping back will happen, snapping back will happen, but I'm pretty confident that, that it has to come because human beings are not endlessly plastic and flexible. Uh, I think that we have certain historical norms in which we're designed to flourish and find fulfillment. Sooner or later, we'll find our way back to them. So all Muslims need to do is to keep those norms and say, hey, look guys, we're the ones who still have this. And then people who are drowning out in the sea of questions will make signals and they'll want to climb on board our ship. It's so exhausting um, to see a three-year-old child asked by um, middle-class, usually parents in the Western setting, darling, what do you want to eat? Now, the three-year-old doesn't know the options. The three-year-old doesn't know you've got salmon in the fridge or it's porridge for dinner. And that can lead to a great amount of anxiety. I call yep. it Jeff, the tyranny of choice. Yep. Uh, you know, go, go into that because there's, there's so much of our youth in need of self-development and mentoring and counseling. You know, that tyranny of choice is exhausting. We're like burdening every choice of the universe on our shoulders and we don't know where to turn. Yeah, uh, one issue for us, I think, that awaits an answer is the extent of human neuroplasticity. In other words, <coughs> how far can we get from historically normal patterns of human behavior and expectation before we really start to crack up? Maybe these dysfunctions that we're seeing in society at the moment are a kind of inner version of what's happening to the environment outside us, that non-sustainable forms of economic growth are destroying the planet, non-sustainable forms of human behavior are starting to mess us up inside, which is why everybody's popping pills now. We're a Prozac nation, mm -hmm. but a pharmaceutical solution is not a good long-term option, I'm afraid. So historically, and I think it's useful to remember that Islam calls itself Deen al-Fitra, the religion of the primordial natural disposition. And that's part of the Hanifiya, the Abrahamic ancient primordiality of Islam. And part of its Khatmiya, which I talk about, that the religion which is the last, recapitulates many of the primordial features of, of, the, of, of very early times, that really for 99% of the history of human beings, as paleontologists now understand it, we have been hunter-gatherers living with our religious forms in primordial, you know, in virgin nature, basically engaging with that. And young people, for the survival of the tribe, have had their brains designed in order to find pleasure and satisfaction and fulfillment by being part of those social groups and by being initiated into certain responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So when he reaches adolescence, for instance, the boy 
is taken out into the clearing in the jungle by the elders of the tribe and tattooed or some physical thing happens and is initiated into some secret mysteries and returns as a man. And everybody in the society knows what a man is and the dignity of that. And the boy now has that fulfillment and dignity and everything makes sense. The same for the girl. When she becomes old enough to have a child, she goes into that female space with all of its amazingness and everybody recognizes that. And the brain clearly releases the endorphins that bring about human happiness through what is historically part of ensuring the survival of, of the tribe in, in marginal and precarious situations. We haven't changed from that time. Um, maybe the neuroscientists will change us to adapt our brain so that we can accept the new world of, you know, the tyranny of choice, as you mm. put it, but we're not there yet. So we're creatures designed for the rainforest, really, for a kind of Eden, for this fitra, and Islam is very big on emphasizing you know, our relationship to, to nature. Uh, but we're in this sort of high-tech digital environment with its weird new relationships and pressures and uh, new invitations to decide our own identity. And we really can't cope, I think. Increasingly, people are stressed and anxious and unhappy and shaky. And it's really very sad. So we should treat Islam really as Deen al-Fitra, as that which conserves in a modern or postmodern environment because to bring a kind of primordial type of religion from the rainforest somewhere and trying to make that work, if you have a job in modern Britain, is really much more challenging. But this ancient Fitri thing with its forms of worship and its forms of life unchanged uh, represents a kind of, uh, again, the lifeboat, maybe the last one mm. uh, that people can see. Here is normality. Here is what in my deep Fitra urgings I can see is actually normal for human beings and which will keep societies together and which will enable me to be calm in my headspace and give me a form of meditation and chanting and prayer and that's what human beings are and without that there's something missing. SubhanAllah. Our most important lifeboat of course Sheikh is the Holy Quran and you mentioned many ayat mashallah in, in your book talking about mitigating anger or justifiable anger versus you know um daily daily furies or the pathetic yet violent ire of of pharaoh which was vengeful can you can you share with us especially our young people out there i really i really feel for our university and post-university uh age group right now you and i i know you have a uh, youngsters who are either going through university or finished. I've got a daughter in university and that, you know, the new study just today in the UK has found, you know, 52% are now struggling university students yep. with mental health issues. These are anxiety, these are depression, these are panic attacks, these are not knowing where the future lies. Let's share, please, mm -hmm. please share, share some of the Holy Quran to give us that ease and to guide humanity. Yeah, I mean, the Qur'an has all of these prophetic stories, which are all icons of possibilities within ourselves and within society. The world is today full of pharaohs and nimrods and full of ordinary but generally powerless individuals who want to live a more decent life. Uh, it's the eternal conflict between ego and spirit, which the modern world doesn't quite understand, because increasingly they think ego is what you are self-esteem, self-discovery, all of these uh, strange terms which uh, historical spiritualities would regard as really subversive because you transcend the self, the self is selfish, you don't want your ego, you want to grow into your true mm -hmm. spiritual form. And yeah, the book is really quite strongly rooted in the Quran because having been Muslim for 40 years now, I find more and more that the Quran really has, has got it sorted that the basic possibilities of the human condition vertically and horizontally with the creator and with each other, with the environment, with our inner demons, with our moral uh, tumult, it really it's all there in the Quranic texts and the Quranic stories, but set out, of course, in God's way, not in a human way. So you have to assimilate yourself to the discourse of the text and the way it wants to take us through these, through these narratives. It's, it's an initiation, really. The Quran is an initiation in the fullness of 
of sacred humanity. So when it comes to anger, I have a whole chapter because a lot of Muslims are really angry nowadays, but you know, everybody's angry. If you look at Brexit, if you look at the American elections, it's an angry age. People aren't getting what they want or what they think they want. Uh, there is obviously a righteous anger, which is a prophetic anger, which is not for the self, but which is when you see God's rights or the rights of others infringed. So the old stoic idea of some Greek philosophers that the ideal is not to feel any emotion is very alien to the prophetic mm. way. The Holy Prophet وسلم, when he saw oppression would really become angry and that's part of his humanity. But all too often nowadays we are possessed not by anger for God but anger for ourselves because we feel that we've been threatened, somebody's stepped on our toes, somebody's demeaned us and this is much more common. And uh, the Quran has this diagnosis of the Hamiyat al Jahiliya, the feverish anger and the emotive state of the people of the Jahiliya. Those who didn't really believe that the world was in, in good hands, but was in the hands of various weird tribal deities, which was not a very sort of tranquility inducing worldview, because they were always fighting, just as their tribes were fighting. Uh, and that that uh, deep existential anger and feverishness is something that cannot exist in the heart of the believer. Because the believer, while feeling angry about injustice, also has this hasbun Allah wa ni'ma wa Allah is enough for us and, a, uh, and he is the best guardian. Uh, and we say, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no strength and no power except in God. So to the extent that we say those things, when we see things going wrong, then we're in the Quran's world. To the extent that we start to shout and fight and complain and cry and get depressed, then we're in the world of Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan and, and that Jahiliya. And unfortunately, a lot of the emotion that people feel now and their values and their symbols and their communities are attacked tends to be more tribal than about truth. So that the ulama say, the rarest and the most difficult emotion is anger for God because usually we're just angry for ourselves. And it's really hard to be detached about yourself and your own feelings, but really to care about, about truth. And that's a mistake that a lot of Muslims are making. And it gets us into endless trouble. If you look at the various failures politically of the Muslim world, Palestine, for instance, you know, rather than calculating carefully what to do with this monster occupation, too much kind of reflexive anger and gut feeling and this hamia, which is from another part of perhaps the ancient Arab personality, which just hasn't served them. Because as the uh, ancient Chinese strategist of war said, uh, always try to make your enemy angry. And very often this has been done to the Palestinians. And when people are angry, they don't make good judgment. So they don't calculate in a cool and sensible way. So they lose out. So anger, yes but it has to be a disciplined and a cold anger. And that's a very important distinction for us to make because there's so much that legitimately angers us about the uproar of the modern world, but we mustn't get into that jahili tribal state where the anger actually blinds us to justice or to uh, a sensible and successful strategy. SubhanAllah, I, I actually remember raising um, several years ago, the fact that actually if the Muslims were all really angry we wouldn't there wouldn't be there wouldn't be much of a world left right now because it's yep. it's because of the quran that yep. so many in palestine and beyond are actually able to survive in a calm way yep. and we can do this we can do this if yep. they can survive with with peace in their hearts you know in gaza if they can survive in kashmir if there are yeah. uyghurs still able to make dua surely brothers and sisters we can do this in the uk i'll leave the final thought to you please um sheikh and perhaps a, a dua inshallah the book really is about well it's not really about anything new uh, it's about a reminder that the land always belongs to god and that wherever we go we are the people who understand the land and we are the only people now who put our foreheads on the land, honoring it with, with the act of, of Salat, uh, that we are the Ummah of 
the end times and the ummah of everywhere, that Islam is universal, and we should be more thankful for this ni'mah. The Quran says, Alhamdulillah, for the blessing of Islam, and it's a sufficient blessing. So even if every other blessing is taken away from us and we haven't got jobs and we're refugees or whatever, if we have that ni'mah, or kafa biha ni'mah, the Quran says, uh, it is a sufficient blessing. Mm. And I think we need to, to get out of the misery zone and into the thankfulness zone that we do have this beautiful tawheed and these beautiful practices which are going to keep us sane as the world gets more and more crazy. And inshallah, the ummah will be strong enough to, to hold on to this rope without, without compromise and won't get into any state of, of negativity or despair because that's, um, that's a near neighbor to kufr. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And inshallah, the conversation has been of some benefit. And uh, inshallah, may we all be guided and continue on the path of learning because even people who've written books immediately realize that there's all kinds of things they should have included. And Allah alone is perfect and Allah alone is the all knowing. But thank you very much. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Barakallahu feek. Thanks very much, uh, Sheikh. May Allah increase you in well being, tawfiq, your community with many blessings and barakah. That's it for this time. See you again, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.